We are here today during this time of sickness, fear, and uncertainty. And while it is easier to note the difficulties before us, I implore everyone instead to quiet our minds and give thanks for all our blessings. We give thanks for the gift of community, this gathering of healers who support each other. We give thanks for the fortitude bestowed on us that we may continue to serve our patients bravely. We give thanks for this occasion to honor Dr. Resurrection and other fallen comrades. Their lives are our beacons, ever guiding us, ever reminding us that life is full of opportunities to be heroes. We give thanks in your name. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the Philippine Society of Pediatric Surgeons, Dr. Santiago Aquino. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the first part of June Resurrection's Pediatric Surgery Webinar Series, entitled Challenges in Pediatric Surgery in COVID-19 Pandemic. This is a project of the Philippine Society of Pediatric Surgeon Council for this year, 2020. For this series, I would like to acknowledge our speakers for today. Also, I would like to express my gratitude to the members of the committee that are currently handling this webinar and to the participating fellows in training from PCMC, PGH, SPMC, and NCH. Finally, to the participants from different specialties and regions in the Philippines, who will listen to the interesting lectures prepared by our distinguished speakers. I am sincerely thankful for your presence. I hope our minds be enriched with new information by the end of this webinar. Thank you and good morning. Please welcome the President of the Philippine College of Surgeons, Dr. Jose Antonio Salu. Good morning. In late March of this year, one of the pillars in the pediatric surgery community, Dr. Leandro June Resurrection III, a staunch advocate of laparoscopic surgery and liver transplantation in the pediatric age group, passed away a victim of the COVID-19 scourge. He was my friend, a co-director in the board of the Philippine Association of Laparoscopic and Endoscopic Surgery a few years back, and my partner, along with Dr. Alex Palines, in eating tamilok, the woodworm endemic in Palawan, during one of our palace surgical missions in Puerto Princesa in 2018. He was a rock star in pediatric surgery in the Philippines, as the CNN commentator Wolf Blitzer called him, and his death left a gaping hole in the pediatric surgical society, in the institutions he was connected with, and in our hearts and minds. This webinar, the first in a series to be presented every two weeks by the Philippine Society of Pediatric Surgeons, is named after this courageous friend of ours who passed away too soon. In the obituary of for June of the PCS in its Facebook page, it was written, On the sands of time, you have left your footprints with glory. 
everyone will know your name and shall recall your story. I, along with the Board of Regents of the Philippine College of Surgeons, are one with the Philippine Society of Pediatric Surgeons in dedicating this webinar in your name, June, and in your memory and your legacy, it will live forever. Rest in eternal peace, June. We extend our greetings to the Board of Directors of the PSPS, headed by Dr. Santiago Aquino, for once again preparing a most informative webinar in the management of the pediatric age surgical patient with a sterling lineup of experts in the various fields of pediatric care. The topics for discussion are indeed engaging, and I hope much information can be gained by all who are present who care for this most delicate and fragile subset of our population. Thank you and good day. For a short introduction to our webinar series, here is Dr. Bong Tuazon. Good morning to all my colleagues in the medical and surgical fields. I welcome you all warmly to our series of webinars hosted by the Philippine Society of Pediatric Surgeons, conceptualized in honor of Dr. June Resurrection III, one of our beloved comrades in the Society of Pediatric Surgery, who recently passed away too soon after he succumbed to COVID-19. Kuya June Resurrection, for some of you who don't know him, is a pediatric liver transplant specialist and an advocate of pediatric laparoscopy. All his professional life was dedicated to serving the Filipino patients. Despite having numerous opportunities to work abroad, he chose to remain with us and serve the Filipino children. Being one of the rare liberal transplant experts in pediatrics, his untimely demise is a huge loss to all of us. It is for this reason that we commemorate him through this webinar series. The Philippine Society of Pediatric Surgeons have come up with four webinars that are equally relevant and informative. In this period of COVID-19 pandemic, I believe that as doctors, it is our responsibility to still keep ourselves well-informed, updated, and able to cope with the changes despite this present crisis. For this reason, we have prepared four different webinar topics, namely, Challenges in Pediatric Surgery in Times of COVID-19, with high incidence of COVID-19 cases present, and especially among the young ones, there is a challenge in presentation, diagnosis, and management of these patients. We have invited five pediatric subspecialists to help us manage our patients in the areas related to their expertise. August 13, stem cell therapy and its application on pediatric patients. We have invited two distinguished speakers to talk about the latest management and innovation in the use of stem cell therapy in certain pediatric conditions. This is a topic not to be missed. On August 27 is the role of social media and telemedicine in healthcare and the possible liabilities involved. We have invited medical experts on how to do the proper teleconsultation and a medical legal counsel to give us tips on how to do online consultation with minimal risk. And lastly, on September 4, a very interesting topic for all of us, and this is Entrepreneurship 101 for Doctors. Admittedly, this pandemic has brought most of us lost in income flow. We have medical guest speakers who will give us few personal tips on how to start another stream of income. What kind of business will suit our lifestyles as doctors while still maintaining our profession? We have also invited speakers on wealth management and preservation. We have carefully selected four different webinar topics to cater to the need of this time of pandemic to help our fellow medical professionals adapt and thrive in this so-called new normal. We hope you will take part in this series of four interesting webinars. 
Thank you very much, and God bless you all. A few words from the family of Dr. June Resurrection. Hello, everyone. Um, I'd like to welcome you all to the PSPS webinar in honor of my father, the late Dr. Leandro Resurrection III. Um, I would like to start things off by introducing him a bit from the perspective of a daughter. So ever since I was young, I would always tag along with my dad when he went to his clinics or when he did rounds in the hospital. And I adored him so much. He was my idol. And I'm sure this comes as no surprise to anybody who knew him or anybody who was friends with him because they probably knew how understanding, how supportive, how selfless he was towards us, his children. And as I grew older and as I saw him interact with his patients and as I, as I saw him in the hospital, that's when I realized that this selflessness, this support, this understanding, he extended it and it went beyond the four walls of our home because he treated each and every one of his patients as if they were one of his own children. And his job, his job was his passion, really. You know, he would tell me every day about how tired he is, but I could tell how much he loves doing his job. Multiple times he was multiple times he was offered opportunities to further his practice elsewhere and multiple times he declined. And that's because his heart has always been with the Filipino children. And even though he's not with us anymore, I'm sure that it never left. I hope to see my dad live the rest of his life through the many aspiring doctors in the country. And like him, I hope their passion to serve never stops burning. So stay safe and thank you all again for being here. To start the webinar proper, here is Dr. Edric Lin to introduce our speakers. Good morning, everyone. It is a privilege to introduce our speakers for this morning. Our first speaker is Dr. Maria Imelda Vilen Vitug Sales. She will talk on the medical abdomen in children with COVID-19. She is a pediatric gastroenterologist. Uh, she is the immediate past president of the Philippine Society of Gastroenterology, Hepatology, and Nutrition. She has a, she had her general pediatrics residency at the Makati Medical Center and fellowship in gastroenterology in Sydney Children's Hospital in Australia. She is presently an active staff in pediatric gastroenterology in Makati Medical Center and Asian Hospital. Our second speaker is Dr. Esther Sagil. She will talk on the surgical abdomen on the background of COVID-19. She is a fellow pediatric surgeon, a graduate of UP College of Medicine, and had her residency and fellowship at UPTGH. She also had a fellowship in pediatric surgery at Kobe Children's Hospital in Japan. Presently, she is the training officer in the Division of Pediatric Surgery, UPTGH, and the founding and current president of the Philippine Surgical Infection Society. Our next three speakers will talk on the perioperative considerations on surgical child in the background of COVID-19. Our third speaker, Dr. Mary Ann S. Fernando Ison, a graduate of FEU. Her training in general pediatrics is at the Philippine Children's Medical Center and had her fellowship in pediatric pulmonology at Philippine Children's Medical Center. She is the immediate past president of the Philippine Academy of Pediatric Pulmonology, Incorporated, and is presently the head section of pulmonology at Philippine Children's Medical Center. And as an active consultant at the Philippine Children's Medical Center and Cardinal Santos Medical Center. Our fourth speaker is Dr. Fatima I. Jimenez. She is a graduate of UERM, had her pediatric residency at the Medical City, 
had her fellowship in pediatric infectious disease at Philippine Children's Medical Center. Also had further training in infectious diseases at Baylor College Medical College of Medicine, Houston, Texas. She is the present Vice President of the Pediatric Infectious Disease Society of the Philippines and the Training Officer of the PID section at PCMC. She is a consultant at PCMC, BRPMC, the Medical City, V. Luna, and Philippine Heart Center. Our fifth speaker is Dr. Benjamin David S. Valera. He is a graduate of UERM. He is the current president of the Philippine Society of Anesthesiologists and a vice president of the board of trustees of the Philippine Board of Anesthesiology. He is a clinical professor at UP, UP College of Medicine and a consultant in the following hospitals, UPPGH, Asian Hospital, and St. Luke's Global. So let's start, and don't forget to ask your questions for the lectures on the Q&A, the chat box, and chat live. Thank you. Let us welcome our first speaker, Dr. Salas. So good morning. I was tasked to talk about medical causes of acute abdominal pain in children. Acute abdominal pain is a common complaint in childhood, and it can be caused by a wide range of underlying medical and surgical conditions. It has always been a challenge because of the nonspecific nature of symptoms and difficulty in assessment and physical examination in children. Although most children with acute abdominal pain have self-limited benign conditions, pain may be a manifestation of an urgent surgical or medical condition where the biggest challenge is making a timely diagnosis and initiating appropriate treatment because 20% of these abdominal pains may point to a surgical etiology. Abdominal pain in children varies with age, associated symptoms, and pain location. It poses a diagnostic challenge owing to the variety of underlying causes. For today, we will focus on medical causes of acute abdominal pain. So while obtaining a detailed history, it would be prudent to make an initial assessment on the patient's overall appearance as it gives you an idea of the severity of the pain. Pain history is focused on these three components, a description of the pain itself, associated symptoms, and predisposing conditions. When getting your pain history, include the onset of the pain to determine whether it's acute or chronic. Determine the location, whether it's epigastric, periumbilical, or left or right upper quadrant or hypogastric areas. However, younger children are not able to discriminate the area of the pain. A poorly localized pain that improves with movement implies visceral pain from hollow organs, while a well-localized pain that worsens with movement may be parietal in nature with pain receptors responding to stretching, tearing, or inflammation. A description of pain in most kids may be that um, diffuse or generalized, needing a good physical exam. Crampy or colicky pains may signal infantile colic or acute gastroenteritis, while epigastric or burning pains may be due to your gastroesophageal reflux disease. Ask as well about the frequency, the duration, and the timing of the pain. As for example, for infantile colic, the pain is usually at a certain time of the day, um, usually in the evenings, while um, also ask for any association with uh, meal intakes, such as your uh, reflux, GERD, and constipation, which may be related to meal intakes. Remember that the quality and radiation of pain is not a strong predictor of acute appendicitis. And the longer the duration of the pain, the less likely it is to be surgical in nature. 
there's a need to determine associated symptoms as well as focusing on the abdomen alone may lead to missing other causes. Fever may be a signal of inflammation or infection. Extra intestinal symptoms such as your cough, flank pains, or dysuria may point to the etiology of the pain. Any factors that make the pain better or worse, such as movement, defecation, food, or any medication. Um, for example, cholecystitis would present with pain after meal intake. Um, and your epigastric pain is uh, for your acid peptic disease may be related to meal intake. Do not forget to get a menstrual history when, do, when you are uh, with a female adolescent as it may point to a gynecologic etiology. Predisposing conditions such as a previous viral infection may signal hinoxiana and purpura, especially if they have joint pains or rashes. And a previous surgery will always make you think of adhesions. Now, um, do not forget to get a detailed drug history as well uh, for possible ingestions. Now, because it is COVID, um, and there's a high risk for COVID, we end up doing teleconsults, which limits our physical exam. But we should be able to assess the general appearance, presence of tenderness, or view any scars, rashes, and even assess dehydration. So when doing your physical exam, um, it involves uh, overall appearance assessment, establishing eye contact, and observing the activity level of the child, which you may do while doing your history. Check for the presence of rashes, jaundice, or operative scars. You may even um, assess hydration by asking the mom or the child to check skin pinch in front of the camera. You may even ask them to lay down in front of the camera to assess abdominal distension, as the child may be more comfortable in a, uh, in a home setting than in the clinic, then they may be more cooperative. Ask to position the camera so the mom can do palpation of abdominal quadrants in the epigastric, mid, hypogastric areas, and you can assess while the, uh, the mom does the palpation. If the patient is an adolescent, then the patient may do it themselves and you make the patient talk and watch for signs of discomfort or pain. You can ask them to do maneuvers such as jumping up and down or changing in position to check if it will worsen the pain. Remember that a child that moves without caution and is able to walk without bending from the waist or a child who is able to hop or jump repeatedly without flinching is unlikely to have an acute inflammatory intra-abdominal disease. On the other hand, peritonitis must be considered if the, if the patient experiences discomfort with jumping and refuses to repeat the maneuver, or if the patient prefers to lie still. I have here a list of laboratory and radiologic imaging, which may support your diagnosis. The, more, the most important thing is actually ruling out a surgical abdomen. If we are talking about younger children, then you need to rule out intussusception, malrotation, or volvulus. If we are talking about older children, then you need to rule out acute appendicitis. The following are red flags, which may point out to a more serious organic pathology. The presence of vomiting, villus emesis, if the pain awakens the child at night, if the pain is away from the peri-umbilical area, if there's any sign of GI bleeding, if there's growth failure, or if there's chronic diarrhea. The age of the child can help focus on the, diagnosi uh, on the diagnosis. However, at any age, the following are the more common causes of medical abdominal pain. 
So let's start with your acute gastroenteritis. Your acute gastroenteritis is described as a crampy and diffuse abdominal pain occurring before the appearance of your diarrhea and or vomiting. Is it COVID related? Well, reports say that 10% of children with COVID may present with vomiting and diarrhea, but treatment will still lie on rehydration. What about constipation? Constipation is actually the most frequently identified cause of your acute abdominal pain. It's not a medical emergency, but it often presents as such. Abdominal pain is uh, usually colicky and is noted during and after meals. So you have to ask for stooling patterns um, as they have a history of difficulty in defecation, they have tenesmos, and their stools are either large in diameter or small and pebbly. Urinary tract infection is another cause of com uh, common cause of abdominal pain. It's described as a sudden sharp pain with associated fever and vomiting. Older children may have a history of dysuria, frequency, or flank pains. Your infantile colic occurs in infants less than six months old. It has a typical pattern of paroxysmal crying, usually at a certain time every day. And it usually peaks in the evenings with no other symptoms, or they're usually um, okay during daytime, and they are relieved by the passage of gas. Your gastroesophageal reflux disease is another cause of your acute abdominal pain. Um, it may be described as epigastric and burning, and it's associated with vomiting, retching, the presence of heartburn, and may be relieved by food intake. Now, pancreatitis, not as common, but may also present with acute abdominal pain, um, especially in older children. So it's described as epigastric, uh, but diffuse abdominal pain is not uncommon. It's constant, sharp, and severe, and may radiate to the back with associated fever and abdominal distension. So your great turner sign is almost never present. Now, lastly, your pneumonia is not as common, but may present with abdominal pain, especially if it involves the lower lobes. They have been associated with respiratory symptoms, such as your cough, a fever, tachypnea. A vomiting is usually post in nature, and in the context of COVID, family clustering plays a major role. So you need to ask for a history of exposure. So in summary, most children um, who have acute abdominal pain uh, may be short, self-resolving, and non-life-threatening. Majority of your abdominal pain is functional in nature with constipation accounting for almost 48%. The most important and most attainable initial goal in the evaluation of acute abdominal pain is to differentiate surgical and non-surgical conditions. Unfortunately, a small number of patients with acute abdominal pain may not receive a definitive diagnosis on the first evaluation because of the early stage of the disease or subtle or atypical signs, needing a follow-up in 24 hours if there is no improvement. So that's the last slide and thank you. Now to speak on pediatric surgical abdomen, we have Dr. Esther Sagil. Good morning. I'm Dr. Esther Sagil, and I'm going to talk about the pediatric surgical abdomen amid the COVID-19 pandemic. COVID-19 has really affected families worldwide. And since the onset of this disease, we have already noted, even in uh, Switzerland, that the children are much less affected than adults in terms of severity and frequency. And they usually just account for under 2% of all cases. And like other viral respiratory infections, they do not seem to be major vectors in tra transmission. And there are still, as of yet, no documentation of child-to-child -child or child-to-adult transmission. What do we know at this time? Very few 
our pediatric patients in the COVID wards. In PGH, uh, roughly about 8% of all cases at any given time. And COVID-positive pediatric patients are often asymptomatic, even if they are shown to have very high viral loads, while the rest have symptoms like fever, attributable to the surgical condition like in patients with appendicitis. It is also very unusual for pediatric patients to be the index case for COVID infection as evidenced in three U.S. children's hospitals. However, slowly we're already gathering information about patients uh, in the neonatal and infant age group who are developing and manifesting and coronavirus coronavirus diseases and much still has to be known except that as far as most cases are concerned the clinical course is generally more favorable compared to adults. Unfortunately last month this article came out and it documented the transplacental transmission of SARS-CoV-2 infection. This was seen in a mother with very high viral loads and there was note of placental inflammation and all these were documented with histologic and examination and immunohistochemistry. So it's very important because we have to follow up these patients long term. We already know that neurological manifestations are seen in patients long term in COVID diseases. About a week ago, this article came out in news articles and the outbreaks have been noted in NICUS in the British Columbia. So in this case, the vector was actually the healthcare worker. So we know now that the source of infection in children and neon, particularly neonates are either the mothers or the healthcare workers who take care of them. What has been our experience with COVID-19? Our very first experience was actually having to do tracheostomies for chronically ventilated patients in the neurosurgical service. These patients had pituitary tumors and had already been on uh, ventilators for more than two months and they initially had COVID infection. So there was a lot of debate on who would do the tracheostomy and when was the best time to do it. This was during the early part of the pandemic sometime in April and our ORL colleagues our neurosurgical colleagues were actually at loggerheads at when the time it would be. Our medical uh, counterparts were pleading to us to do the tracheostomy already because they could not trans out the patient from the ICU or they could not send home the patients. So these were our first challenges and we decided that having a negative swab is already enough but we would still wear uh, level 4 PPEs. The second experience is having to do appendectomies for asymptomatic COVID patients. In the early part of the pandemic, our results would only come out after day fifth day, seventh day, and that we would have done the appendectomy and the patient would have been sent home already. So it was just a retrospective diagnosis. It would just be informed as an in hindsight. Thankfully, these patients all went, uh, there were about three patients who were like this, and they went home, they did not have any problems, so the asymptomatic status was maintained throughout. One case was a malrotation with volvulus, which thankfully detorted, and this patient unfortunately also developed, went into a cytokine storm, so this patient was managed intensively. And after two weeks, after the COVID uh, infection had passed, that was the only time we were were able to do the LADS procedure. And the fourth occasion when we had to do a patient, patients with COVID-19 was stomal reversal in patients with short bowel syndromes. These were patients with intestinal atresias. And because of the short bowel, in spite of all the gastrointestinal manipulation that we had to do, we did all the dietary manipulation, medical management. Uh, we could not uh, wean this patient off from TPN. So after four months of waiting, we finally did stomal reversion. And unfortunately, even with already a negative swab, this patient still went into problems and into septic complications. So suffice it to say, it's still unknown as to what the final uh, outcome will be. But we all pray for a good outcome and we prepare the patient properly or prepare the patient as really intensively. Unfortunately, we already have the data that about even in the early part of the pandemic in the UK, 52% will develop um, complications, most of them in the pulmonary system. So this has to be taken into consideration all the time. So what has been our current ex 
experience with the pediatric surgical abdomen. I would like to talk to something about interception because two mothers, of they were educated mothers with good jobs and they knew how to do telemedicine. So they had infants, one was six month old, one is an eight month old, who both showed, came up with what seemed to be abdominal pain and irritability and these babies had blood tinged tools. Both mothers sought consultations through telemedicine and they were both told just observe the vomiting, just see if the patient's symptoms will worsen over time for any signs of dehydration so that by the time that the patients were able to bring this, their babies to the ER, the abdomen was already surgical and the bowel resection was already was necessary because the intersusception was already gangrenous. So I could not bring myself to tell these moms, why did you just bring the patient now? Because they were not late in seeking consult. Unfortunately, apparently the physician who was on the other end of the telemed in the telemedicine side was still not very adept at pediatric surgical diagnosis. So this became a case of late intervention, late consult and late intervention. But I also know that because we know that interception, if you get them early, you c we can do pneumatic or hydrostatic reduction. But our experience with our radiologists has also been like this. They refuse to do pneumatic or hydrostatic reduction or even a barium enema or upper GI series because of uh, data, information, and evidence that state that the coronavirus can be excreted to the feces okay, and even through the fart. So we've had radiologists even now who request that a patient have a swab, a negative swab, before they will perform a test or a procedure. So now it seems that our co-workers are thinking that, are of the mindset that surgeons or a surgery is much safer because you're all in, in level 4 PPS and it's a much more controlled environment rather than a radiologic suite. Uh, suite. So it has been my experience in several hospitals already that the Diagnostic tests, uh, imaging could not be done because the radiologists refused to perform them. So such is the problem now with the coronavirus pandemic. Now how about for complicated appendicitis? Unfortunately, all patients have managed during this pandemic, all under seven years old were ruptured appendicitis with generalized peritonitis. Three of them we were already in septic shock and I could not operate in them. I had to prepare them for more than 24 hours. The symptoms ranged from two to six days. Why did this patient come in septic shock? Two parents were very scared to bring the child to the hospital because they knew that COVID cases were admitted in the hospitals or the patient would be placed in a ward where there were COVID cases. So they, they were that scared. Second, the patient was denied admission in more than three hospitals, so they kept on moving from one hospital to the other, trying to be admitted. And because everybody's saying we're full, we don't have manpower, our ER is closed, the management was delayed. And the last was even the primary MD was also apprehensive about admitting the patient with minor symptoms of abdominal pain, vague abdominal pain, no fever. MD requested for an ultrasound, which unfortunately is normal, and opted uh, to observe the patient remotely. So by the time the symptom disease had evolved, the patient came to the ER, the patient was already in uh, shocky, and we had to start inotropes and really prepare, hydrate the patient well. So I was even told in this patient, this was a six-year-old patient, that it was a normal abdomen, and I could tell that the resident who first saw the patient did not do a complete PE or at least did not do a very thorough PE because even the residents in many emergency rooms are very scared about doing a complete history and physical examination. I had to confront several residents and they told me, mom, I tried to shorten my history as much as possible and the baby kept on crying and I was afraid of aerosols being generated by the crying and I could not even argue with him on that but he told me that he was going to ask for a CT scan so I told him show me the CT the x-ray first and lo and behold there were already fecal and you could see fluid and I could tell 
with the WBC count of this patient was already 19. This, this patient and the history was already about three days. This patient probably had ruptured appendicitis, and true enough, this patient had general respiratory tinnitus already. So how about for uncomplicated appendicitis? Uh, in the Philippine setting, ultrasound has poor sensitivity, that I can tell you. And in the context of the COVID pandemic, the ultrasound is not always easy to schedule. In fact, in many urban hospitals, the CT scan is with IV contrast and even easier to schedule. But as we said earlier, even in pre-COVID times, we do not like exposing our children to any more radiation than is actually necessary. And as I said earlier in the previous slide, nobody really looks at the x-rays too much and most of the staff wanted to leave the patient's bedside ASAP and really the patient was really lacking. Now for uncomplicated appendicitis, there is an option to do non-operative management and I offer it with caution in older children, in older children mainly because most of the younger children had ruptured appendicitis to begin with. After documentation of appendicitis with imaging, there being no fecalith, I recommend using cefuroxime and metronidazole in, a, in combination. And success rate for complete resolution of symptoms is about 75%. Lo and behold, all the parents agreed to the non-operative management trial. So the um, nice thing about using cefuroxime and metronidazole is after giving them IV intravenously for about two to three days, there is a step down to the oral route. Currently, our antimicrobial resistance patterns show that cefuroxime is already is already okay. okay. The sensitivity now to from of Enterobacter is about 70%. So it's fair, fairly okay compared to the five years ago and when the sensitivity of E. coli and Enterobacter species went down as low as 39%. So again, for acute abdomen x-rays, you can see that the massive dilated by bowels, and I was being told the abdomen was non-tender, but there, again, there's a huge fecalith there. There's a huge fecalith there, and we know that we have to do something about this patient. So my plea is to take a look at the x-rays and try to make some, imp um, some, some try to make some diagnosis there. There is already interstitial fluid, thickening of the bowel loops, dilated bowel loops, and a fecalith with a history of four days that's probably already ruptured with generalized peritonitis. So are there any differences in clinical presentation, whether the child has COVID-19 or not? We have very few patients uh, to work with in COVID-19. Currently, we do not see any difference in clinical presentation. What is actually different is how the patients are being assessed at the ER, particularly the fear of the staff that they may contract the infection. The possibility of having a symptomatic COVID status should be considered uh, because this poses risks to all those attending health worker workers and, of course, the other patients. Um, it's imperative that we make sure, uh, use of all the screening forms for COVID. I know that we all uh, know about the health declaration forms and it is not enough that you just get the health declaration form from the child. You also have to get the health declaration form from the parents. One of the more important things that we have to understand is in the, even in the national capital region, in the NCR, we have areas where there are lockdowns because they're hotspots. Okay, so if you look at the DOH COVID tracker, you will see them all as red. And when a patient comes from there, there's a very high likelihood that the child may be an asymptomatic uh, carrier. X-rays are recommended before you get think of uh, doing CT scans. And thankfully, laboratories for uh, PCR laboratories, molecular laboratories now have increased so we have more access to the PCR swab test compared to the initial months of this pandemic. In the PGH, every week, we only get about 10 COVID positive pediatric patients and 90% of them have comorbids. The more um, common comorbids are actually malignancies, leukemias, and followed by gastrointestinal malignancies. So we know for a fact that comorbid conditions are a very big um, important risk factor for contracting COVID-19 uh, in children and for getting them in the moderate to severe. Uh, kinds.
So this journal came out last last May, and it's about determining the impact of COVID-19 pandemic on surgical practice. So these bulleted um, lines are those that should be thought of when scheduling cases for surgery, because we all know that it's not just about having increased complications when you do surgery on a patient with COVID-19, whether on elective basis or emergency basis. But more than that, we now think about flattening of the curve. We think about manpower uh, lack, resources lack. So think about these um, factors when you want to schedule. I think in the Philippines, in the among the training programs in pediatric surgery now, uh, very few are doing elective cases because primarily because most of our training programs are in government hospitals, DOH retained government hospitals, so they're very busy also with COVID uh, cases. So what are these factors? It's the impact of delay on primary outcomes. So what does this mean? Like, for example, would you delay doing a pull-through on a patient who has um, Hirschsprung's disease when you know very well that if the patient is already three years old and you delay the, the pull-through, you know, the, the outcome of continence may be affected. Two, the feasibility of alternative procedures with less OR requirements. For in these cases, that would be appendicitis. If it's a simple appendicitis, uncomplicated one without a fecal leaf, then probably we can offer non-operative management. For a periappendicial abscess, where there is a distinct abscess, percutaneous drainage may be attempted. For intussusception, which is not which is not complicated, there's no evidence of gangrene, hydrostatic or pneumatic reduction should be offered. The presence of comorbidities, comorbidities and increased complications should also be borne in mind. For example, having a Down syndrome patient who you would like to do a closure of a um, stoma, remember you have to understand that Down syndrome patients are also immunocompromised and they're also at risk for other complications, especially those with cardiac conditions. The threat to the patient's life is surgery if it's not performed, so this is for emergency surgeries, trauma. The threat of permanent organ dysfunction if the procedure is not performed. And the risk of rapidly progressive symptoms and disease progression. So the last one is for primarily for our malignancies. Um, I know that we were did not do a lot of surgeries, did not do any elective surgeries in the first three months of the pandemic and there were reports that some of our patients succumbed to the primary disease. Uh, I know that for a fact that 20% of those lined up with brain tumors had already died like while awaiting their surgeries. So this is very important that we do not, uh, we do not want patients to die from COVID-19, but we do not want those without COVID-19 to die more. So the morbidity, the casualties, of the non-COVID cases should not be allowed to increase further. So from that article comes this table now about the prioritization for pediatric, pediatric surgical cases. For, so on the left side of the screen, we see that these are primarily intestinal obstruction emergency cases and intestinal obstruction necrotizing enterocolitis perforation for which I would probably do initially drainage. Okay. Anything with ischemia and can cause gonadal or limb, um, sal limb loss, congenital GI abnormalities, complicated appendectomies, testicular torsion. Now, what about less emergent cases like tumor surgeries? This should still be prioritized. Uh, biliary atresia, we know for a fact that there's a golden period for biliary atresia, so we should not delay these patients inordinately. Of course, INDs and abscesses, vascular access device insertion, because these are important, particularly for those who are going to undergo chemotherapy or TPN, symptomatic inguinal hernias. So those who have had an incarceration before, there's already pain or uh, gonadal pain, that hernia surgery should be performed, should be prioritized. Right upper quadrant pain for symptomatic cholelithiasis should also be prioritized. Doing gastrostomy for somebody like somebody with a, um, a child with esophageal atresia, that is also very important. And colectomy for uh, not responsive to conservative management. 
Now, just a word of um, about laparoscopic surgery. Uh, in the early part of this pandemic, there was a lot of concern about aerosol generating procedures such as laparoscopic surgery. But as we have studied um, over the last two or three months, we have determined that with the proper uh, instrumentation and equipment, laparoscopic surgery can be done uh, safely. So it's very important that everything should be prepared. Don't do it uh, without any preparation. So your smoke evacuators, Okay, your PPEs should be complete there. Uh, we have an anesthesiologist on, in this um, webinar, so I will leave it to the anesthesiologist to talk about the risks of anesthesia for the anesthesiologists. Now, what cases would you rather defer? If you have a porta cath that needs to be removed but it's not infected, you can defer it. Any chest wall reconstruction for pectus excavatum, asymptomatic hernias, PSARPs, if you already have a colostomy, Okay, and you just want to do the preserve, it's best to do it uh, at a later date when the pandemic has sort of leveled out. The construction of Hirschsprung's if you already have a diversion. So remember my example earlier was a, pull a primary pull-through. But if you already have a diversion, you already have a colostomy or elostomy, and there's no short, bowel, short gut syndrome, um, the um, pull-through can be scheduled later on. Closure of uh, enterostomies can also be deferred. And uninfected bronchial cleft cysts and sinuses, thyroglossal ducts, phone duplication, okay. even just plain cholecystectomy for biliary colic, no stones, repair of an asymptomatic, no jaundice, no pain, no stones, cholodocal cysts, they can be postponed uh, for now. Even bladder extra, if I was surprised, um, there are no recommendations that you can delay bladder extrophy, even if diagnosed in the early at, at birth. And even gastrostomy for failure to thrive, and I think my team can attest to this, that when the child can have an NGT or an orogastric tube and can be fed through the orogastric tube, there is no hurry in doing gastrostomy, especially if that child has other comorbid conditions. So these are things that you have to um, you, you have to take into consideration when scheduling your cases. Okay. Um, these are now very m more relevant now that we seem to be having a surge. And I think in the next few days, already reached 80,000 uh, cases here in the Philippines. And in a few more days, it's probably going to reach, reach the 85,000 uh, number. So I got this table from the APSA website. And it just shows how they've been responding. The APSA is the American Pediatric Surgical Association. This has been the response to the COVID-19 pandemic. So I would like to just um, bring your attention actually to this, minimizing the work duties. And we've, we've been doing this, alternating the fellows and service, and accepting adult patients. This would have been unheard of. Like, can you think of PCMC or National Children's Hospital accepting adult patients? But as we saw earlier, uh, only 1% to 2% of COVID cases will be pediatric. So it may come to a point that we may have to do, we call it task shifting. We may have to shift our tasks such that even us, we in the pediatric, uh, taking care of pediatric cases, may have to help in... Uh, taking care of adult patients as well. So 10.7% 10, 10 of surgeons have been covering adult services and we've been sharing, they have been sharing equipment of the pediatric, uh, pediatric wards with the adults. Okay? So that's, that's an unheard of thing before, but this pandemic has been forcing us to do things we had never thought of before. So for as far as the clinical flow change uh, is concerned, 80% feel that there's no need to transfer patients. Now, remember, these are pediatric surgical training programs. So unless there's an outbreak and even the doctors in that hospital are affected or under quarantine, we usually don't transfer our patients. For the operative case choice, 58%, um, so about half, report changes in the use of laparoscopy. Uh, people are now more, um, many are now a little wary about using laparoscopy. And 14% are limiting laparoscopy to reduce the spread. 
What is very telling is the increase in telehealth, and I've been working on this more. 95% report the use for OPD visits and even for inpatient consults. So I've resorted to using the telephone to see the wound on the second or third day, and they'll just come back on the fourth day. Okay, so to personally examine the patient because we can see now that we can, don't have to keep on coming to the patients. Apart from the possibility of bringing infection to the patient, we actually are making the patient pay more because we have to use PPEs we have, and it shows in their bills. Okay. Uh, as far as the COVID-19 safety and prevention is concerned, um, universal masking is not really a problem in the Philippines. Um, everybody wears masks, so, but this is uh, more importantly, we have now to limit visitors. Uh, we've also resorted to a no visitor uh, policy and just one caregiver for patients who are up and about and two, if the patient of the child needs to be taken care of, needs uh, further assistance. And apart from just doing swabbing of the patient, we've also resorted, we felt that it was really a cost-effective matter. It was a cost-effective measure to swab the accompanying person too. So in the U.S., they had, this was sometime in uh, late May, they showed a more than 12 hours uh, for the results of the swabbing. So they were able to do swabbing before OR. So now PGH can do this because there's a test, the BD Max, that can give out results as early as three hours. So if you had that um, capability, that's very good because even your emergency cases, you can already delineate who is COVID positive and who is COVID negative because this is a lot of bearing on in what operating room you're going to do the case and in what form of PPE you're going to be wearing and where that patient is going to land after the surgery. So testing is a very important uh, feature. It's a very important criterion because a lot of our manpower resources, you know, uh, resources, uh, when I mean resources, supplies uh, get wasted or get really consumed when we consider all patients as COVID positive because that was how we used to do it in the first two months of this pandemic. And we have been already re reusing and re-sterilizing our N95 masks, but on a very limited basis. Um, here in NCR, I think many are still using K the KN95 from China, to coupled with a face shield. For those who can have those half face respirators, they, do, they use that. And most use either uh, the Sterad or UV lights for sterilizing the N95 masks. So what are fine? It's very difficult, any um, hard and So the decision making should be made uh, based on the best, best available current evidence and consider the resources of the institution and the community. So they talk about ICU beds, ventilators, but in the last four going five months that I've been in the midst of this pandemic, I have seen that ultimately it's actually the manpower resources that has been our greatest limiting factor. When you quarantine employees, nurses, um, nursing aid, even your medical social worker for 14 days, you decrease the manpower automatically by more than half. So asymptomatic, quarantined, no testing done, no symptoms, are quarantined and resting at home. Those who are staying in the hospital and working get more and more tired. And actually right now we're already in our fifth month and it seems that there is a lot of fatigue going on. Okay. So we have to help our co-workers, our healthcare workers in not succumbing to this fatigue. So we all know that patient welfare is extremely important, but the healthcare worker welfare should not be sacrificed. At this time, since not all hospitals have access to rapid results from RT-PCR, it is prudent to manage all emergency cases as COVID positive and if possible, have RT-PCR done pre-op, not just for the patient uh, patient safety, but also to uh, assess and prognosticate the risks of the healthcare workers. 
And as I said earlier, some of our processes may have to be modified in response to the COVID pandemic. So in the past, we used to al allow the mom or the caregiver to bring the baby to the operating room, not anymore. In the past, um, breastfeed was uh, being advocated, but now we ask, we, may, we ask that the mother be swabbed first for breastfeed because it will be more disastrous if the patient contracts infection later on. Knowledge I have now is not the knowledge I had then. We've learned a lot from this pandemic. We'll know a lot more now, July, than we knew last March. But definitely a lot of evidence is emerging. A lot of knowledge is coming out. A vaccine, I believe, is going to be available in the next six months. So the knowledge keeps on coming. So I hope we will all keep abreast with the knowledge and use evidence in all our decision making. Thank you very much. For the pulmonologist standpoint, our speaker is Dr. Ison. Good morning. Before I start, I'd like to thank the Philippine Society of Pediatric Surgeons for inviting me to be a part of its first Dr. June Resurrection Pediatric Surgery webinar series. My discussion will focus on the basic considerations for a child being prepared for surgery amidst this COVID-19 pandemic. In 2011, the Philippine Academy of Pediatric Pulmonologists came out with a position statement on preoperative evaluation, and it stated that there is no patient who carries a zero risk for anesthetic and operative complications, and to state that the patient is clear for surgery is inappropriate. The more appropriate approach would be to assess how much risk a patient has for the contemplated procedure and to minimize the intrinsic risks of anesthesia and surgery. It is a joint responsibility of the entire team to determine the best plan of action for the patient. These are the essential information that we have to help us understand our current situation when we do the pre-op evaluation. The burden of COVID is from 0.8 to 2%. They may present as asymptomatic or with a mild illness. There is the potential of transmitting the virus. Surgery poses additional risk to the COVID patient and the healthcare team. So it is prudent to assume that all patients are COVID positive unless proven otherwise. The objective of the clinical history and physical examination is to detect any unrecognized conditions that can increase the risk of surgery above the baseline risk. So the history and PD must be complete. We ask for any illnesses that may potentially change plans for the procedure, like an upper respiratory tract infection, where it is best to defer surgery for two to four weeks, or asthma and its markers for poor control, since it has been associated with perioperative adverse events. And of course, signs and symptoms of COVID and history of travel or exposure. On PD, we look for potential airway problems that may have implications for anesthesia and the surgical procedure. How about routine lab exams? There are no routine laboratory examinations needed for preoperative evaluation. Testing should be selected and justified by specific findings on the history and PD. If there are abnormal findings, then a specific laboratory test may be requested. Consider institutional protocols if there are any. In our hospital, CDC is a minimum requirement for all surgical procedures. Our pulmonary function tests are currently on hold due to COVID because it may be a source of cross-infection in the pulmonary. ABGs can be done to assess the severity of pneumonia. Both the PSBS and PAPP pre-op update recommend that all patients shall be screened for the risk of having COVID-19. CDC testing strategies outline a clinical criteria for testing, which is the same for children and adults. That include asymptomatic individuals 
even without need or suspected exposure to COVID for early identification in special situations. And universal screening of pediatric patients for COVID preoperatively has allowed hospitals to improve safety. The PAPP update still maintains that chest X-ray is not routine and may be requested in children with underlying pulmonary or cardiac pathology. Chest X-ray or CT scan are not recommended to diagnose COVID because findings on chest imaging are not specific. And if radiologic findings are suggestive of COVID, a confirmation with a viral test is required. So a normal chest CT does not mean a person does not have COVID. And an abnormal chest CT is not specific for COVID diagnosis. But for resource constraint settings like ours, chest imaging may be used as a first step in the workup when rapid triage may be needed to spare other resources like hospital beds and staffing. Now, chest ultrasound is a useful tool in the diagnosis and management of pneumonia. It has its advantages with a high sensitivity and specificity, but of limited value in certain cases, and chest ultrasound findings are also not specific for COVID. After the basic assessment, patients are then classified as either low or high operative risk. Low corresponds to ASA classes 1 and 2, and high to ASA classes 3 and 4, which will require further evaluation by the specialist. As to the timing of surgery, the PAPP adopts the recommendation of the PPS, PCS, and PSPS. Emergency surgery shall be done even without RT-PCR results, but all patients should be swabbed on admission for urgent and elective surgeries, if there is a history of travel or exposure, it is advised to delay the surgery for two weeks, even if asymptomatic, and if with symptoms, to defer until the patient has recovered. Meticulous planning is an important factor in protecting patients and healthcare workers. That involves the creation of policies and protocols with checklists, and visual aids as reminders and guides to all staff to ensure the best possible outcomes. Care should be taken to limit the number of equipment and staff to only those who are essential for patient care to avoid contamination and reduce exposure. All staff need to understand their specific roles and responsibilities, be comfortable with patient and staff flow, PPE use, and specific procedures particularly the aerosol generating procedures or AGPs. WHO, CDC, and the PAPP have guidelines for this. Post-operative management is a crucial phase for all patients, especially for COVID. After surgery, the patient's immune system may be compromised and attention to adequate nutrition, fluid hydration, and electrolyte balance is important. Accumulation of secretions will suggest the potential room for airway clearance and bronchial hygiene in most patients. In the event that ARDS or sepsis will occur, then that too should be managed. WHO recommends the use of droplet, contact, and airborne precautions in addition to the standard, especially with AGPs. In our current situation, we have to keep in mind our objectives for risk assessment, and these are to reduce morbidity and mortality, minimize disease transmission, protect the healthcare workers, and preserve our healthcare system. So the real challenges we face now are the presence of asymptomatic COVID-positive children, the higher risk for morbidity and mortality with COVID, the current limitations in testing capacity and PPEs, and institutional differences in or lack of protocols in some instances. According to the WHO Director General, there may be no return to the old normal for the foreseeable future, but there is a roadmap to a situation 
where we can control COVID-19 and get on with our lives. We must have our own program. And that is our challenge. This is for you. For the perspective of infectious disease, we have Dr. Jimenez. So good morning, everyone. It is an honor and a privilege to be invited to be part of the webinar series to honor a great and exceptional surgeon, Dr. June Resurrection. ESP actually gave me the topic on uh, infectious challenges. And may I just say that it's quite huge for a 10-minute talk, but I will try my best. So this is the outline for today. As of July 25, 2020, uh, we have recorded a total of 78,412 cases and we are still at stage two, meaning we have localized transmission. So I agree with the society, having localized transmission means a lot for those patients who are about to undergo surgery. And I agree that it is prudent to assume that all patients are COVID-19 positive unless proven otherwise, and that adequate personal protective equipment should be worn at all times when handling patients, especially in the operating room. So you asked me about infectious challenges. May I be allowed to say that the challenges are actually contained in the conditions that have been put forth by the Philippine College of Surgeons because all these conditions have implications on decision and management, surgical clearance, as well as infection control recommendations, as well as recommendations for safety precautions for the surgeon, for the patient and his team. So let me walk you through all these conditions that have been laid down. So in the timing of resumption of services, there should be a sustained reduction in the rate of new COVID-19 cases for at least 14 days in your geographic area. If you are lucky, you should also have available rapid RTC-PCR testing kits for both your patient and your staff and let's hope that the turnaround time is quick. Ideally, it should be within 24 or less than 24 hours. Of course, you have to have an appropriate number of trained staff to enable treatment of all patients without compromising patient and staff compromising patient and staff. Next, this is a huge problem I know. You have to have an adequate supply of personal protective equipment and availability of all needed medical and surgical supplies for your planned surgical procedures. And lastly, infrastructure is a challenge and is pertinent and imperative that you have. It is imperative that you have comprehensive facility policies to minimize risk of transmission to patients and the surgical team. But what is the greatest challenge of all? COVID's anatomy is gray. As we speak, we are still looking for the infective dose, possible routes of transmission. We know it's basically uh, respiratory, but you know that there have been reports of the possibility of having airborne transmission, length of infectivity and transmissibility, possibility of reinfection, immunity, and the clinical manifestations are really very nonspecific. For the children that we have seen, whether they presented surgically or not, the most common ones still are respiratory in nature, which is consistent with global data. Diagnostic tests, we also have issues with sensitivity and specificity, timing of these diagnostic tests, and we are still looking for proper treatment. So what is the thing that we do when you give us a call, when our pediatric surgeons give us a call? There are three things 
or three elements that come into play when we assess the patient preoperatively. First of all, we ask for history. Pertinent would be exposure to a probable or a confirmed COVID-19 case. We look at the signs and symptoms, and as I have said previously, it's mostly respiratory in nature for children. And of course, we ask for diagnostic tests that would help us. And these diagnostic tests basically should be interpreted in the best way possible that, so that we will be able to come to a decision. So earlier on in the pandemic, an ID colleague of mine asked me, Timmy, what really is the incidence of COVID-confirmed cases for those about to undergo surgery? I didn't have any paper to look at then. So this is a paper that I got involving three hospitals in the U.S., namely the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, the Seattle Children's Hospital, and the Texas Children's Hospital. So the total number of patients that were to undergo surgery numbered around 1,295. And the age range, okay, the mean age was seven years old, and they found out that incidents varied amongst these three hospitals, but there were only 12 out of the 1,295 that turned positive. And it's also interesting to note that in Philadelphia, five out of the nine cases came from the same community. So what were the preoperative symptoms? For these children, okay, they were basically fever and rhinorrhea, and all those who turned out COVID positive had pertinent exposure. So what is the situation in our country? I was lucky enough to have very good friends who gave me a rough survey of the number of COVID positive cases that presented surgically in their institutions. So I was able to survey two children's hospitals and two COVID facilities. And what were the presenting signs and symptoms? The presenting signs and symptoms of those who came in as surgical conditions were the following. So some of them exhibited fever, bilious vomiting, abdominal pain, abdominal distension, bloody stools, and an abdominal mass. Four out of the 11 had significant chest radiographs. Amongst the COVID-confirmed cases, there were 11 cases in total presenting as surgical conditions. Two had intussusception, one had acute appendicitis, one had ruptured appendicitis with peritonitis, three with partial gut obstruction, secondary to malrotation, one with imperforate anus with rectovestibular fistula, one who presented with necrotizing enterocolitis secondary to sepsis with probable hirschsprung, one with incarcerated inguinal hernia, and one with Meckel's diverticulum. With regards to exposure, only two claim to have exposure to COVID positive cases, only two out of the 11. With regards to the age group, the most affected were children from one month to one year, and there was a male preponderance. So that is the picture locally. With regards to diagnostic tests, I know you're very familiar with these. With regard to your diagnostic tests, we have three kinds. We have your RT-PCR, we have your antigen test, and we have your antibody test. So your antigen test detects viral antigen, but currently this is not recommended by WHO, although research into its performance and diagnostic utility is encouraged. Everyone is very familiar with your RT-PCR, and for your RT-PCR, your specificity is 100%. However, the possibility of having false negative results is real. And in published articles, it ranges from 11 to 40% in symptomatic cohorts. Okay, the reasons that have been put forth, number one, there is inappropriate timing in the collection of specimens in relation to illness onset. 
the probability of detecting your SARS-CoV-2 also varies based on the time of exposure. So immediately following exposure, you may not be able to isolate the antigen. In 33%, uh, okay, you can detect the virus a day before symptom onset, 62% on the day of symptom onset, or 80% on day three of symptoms. It is also imperative to note that prevalence varies widely depending on the characteristics of the population of interest. So another reason for your false negatives using your RT-PCR is there may be deficiency in sampling technique. So the specimen that would yield the highest positivity would actually be your bronchial alveolar lavage, but it's difficult to do. And usually you're only able to do this in very sick or critical patients, followed by your sputum, your nasal swab, and your pharyngeal swab. As you well know, it's your nasal swab and your pharyngeal swab that we use. RTPCR also is prone to false positives because of technical errors and reagent contamination. With regard to your antibody tests, this is important, or these are important in those with mild to moderate symptoms who present late beyond the first two weeks of illness. These can also be used for epidemiologic purposes so that you have an idea of how much infection you have had in your community. However, bear in mind that sensitivity and specificity varies, and this may cross-react with SARS-CoV and other coronaviruses. So this slide basically tells you when it is more appropriate to use either your PCR or your antibodies. Before symptom onset, detection is unlikely. You use your PCR after symptom onset and yield is quite high in the first week of illness, declining after the third week of illness. For antibody detection, you will expect that antibodies appear on the second week of illness with your IgM declining on the fifth week and your IgG persisting beyond seven weeks. So I'm talking about symptomatic patients. So you have seen the utilities of both your PCR and your antibody detection, but let me caution you that antibody detection, okay, shouldn't be used as a screening tool. Now, I do agree with Idsa that testing should be provided for symptomatic patients first. And if you have the facilities and if you have the reagents, it's also prudent to test your asymptomatic patients. So for those who are highly suspected for having COVID or those with a low suspicion for COVID, whether you're hospitalized or you're non-hospitalized, it would be prudent if there is significant exposure to have a test, if it is available. So your history is very important. However, if your test turns out to be negative, but you are still highly suspicious of the person or the patient having COVID-19, it is imperative and it is prudent to repeat your test. Let me share with you something that I got from the Duke Health University with regards to repeat preoperative and pre-procedural testing and these scenarios we have definitely met. So the pediatric surgeons do have their guidelines and I know that you said that it should be done pre-elective surgery or the procedure should be done or the test should be done less than 48 hours, and if there is any problem with regards to turnaround time, then surgery should be done within three to seven days from the time that you had the test. So for this particular table, it says that for outpatients, the recommended timing of the test should be less than 72 hours, 
and you repeat your test if the most recent test was done greater than 72 hours from the scheduled procedure. Now, if the patient has been in the hospital for less than 14 days and is at high risk for community exposure, still the recommended timing of the test should be less than 72 hours. And yes, you do repeat the test if the most recent test was greater than 72 hours from the scheduled procedure. Now for inpatients who have stayed in the hospital for less than 14 days and is not at high risk, meaning that there is no community exposure to a suspected or confirmed case within the last 14 days, then the recommended timing of the test should be less than 72 hours prior to procedure However, a repeat test may be indicated if the most recent test is greater than seven days from the scheduled procedure. Now, if the patient has been at the hospital for greater than 14 days, and this is a common scenario, you don't have to repeat the test if the patient had a prior negative test during the same admission and remains asymptomatic, then your repeat test is not required. Now, this would be dependent on your hospital's situation. Now, I will not discuss, okay, neonates, nor will I discuss those who tested positive at the onset in the interest of time. So what are the key messages to preoperative care assessment? First of all, diagnostic tests have limits and are useful adjuncts to a thorough history and physical examination. Next, your RT-PCR does carry more weight because of higher specificity and moderate sensitivity. And lastly, a negative RT-PCR should not be used to rule out the disease in a person exhibiting symptoms strongly suggestive of COVID-19. This is our infectious disease section in PCMC. We'd like to honor and thank the man who has touched so many lives with his surgical hands. Maraming salamat, Dr. Jane Resurrection. And thank you to the Society for inviting me. Good morning. Our final speaker on anesthesiology concerns, we have Dr. Valera. Thank you very much to the Philippine Society of Pediatric Surgery for this invitation. I'm deeply honored to speak in this webinar named after my good friend, Dr. Resurrection with the theme very appropriate the times, challenges in pediatric surgical patients. For the next nine minutes or so, I will be talking on the perioperative considerations in the surgical patient from the anesthesiologist's point of view. So uh, what is anesthesia? Anesthesia is a rarely therapeutic nor diagnostic, as you all know, but its role in the medical care is very important because it facilitates a lot of the diagnostic and uh, therapeutic interventions, which otherwise are difficult to achieve, like, for instance, a patient in surgery or undergoing a diagnostic procedure where immobility is desirable, like an MRI or a CT scan. It is a branch of medicine which deals with keeping that patient asleep in a state of hypnosis with the absence of pain, a condition known as analgesia, with a property in keeping the patient in a relaxed and calm manner, anxiolysis, in a condition where the patient is in a state of hemostasis, or where the patient is either paralyzed or prevented from having muscles contracting to have a state of immobility and a relaxed musculature so that the patient can be operated on. We all this, we, we do all of those by the administration of drugs or uh, depressant drugs through a variety of routes, the effects of which we do reverse at the end of the procedure. It should also be emphasized that a lot of the procedures that we do as anesthesiologists like bug mass ventilation, endotracheal intubation, laryngoscopy, suctioning, uh, NGT insertion, and the like, are all aerosol-generating procedures, especially when we do general anesthesia in children. So in dealing with a pediatric patient for an abdominal surgery, 
aside from the usual anesthetic considerations like the NPO status, presence of comorbid conditions, electrolyte status, the presence or absence of a difficult airway, concerns on the post-operative pain control. We do have a lot of perioperative concerns shown on this slide. One, is there a need for a preoperative COVID test to a patient, the parent, or the caregiver? Number two, changes in infrastructure. Is the operating room designed to handle a potentially difficult, uh, potentially dirty patient with an infectious disease and not infect the personnel and contaminate the other operating rooms? Number three, we need new needs, like the need for a personal protective equipment, bacterial and viral printers, protective devices like aerosol intubating boxes or even intubating drapes, and a closed system inline suction designed to minimize the suction materials from contaminating the operating room. And lastly, because as mentioned, a lot of the things we do are AGMPs, Anesthesiologists will have to modify the things that they usually do and to tailor our techniques to minimize transmission of an infectious process. There are a lot of questions pertaining to this. Do we need to test a pediatric patient for COVID-19, for elective surgeries, or for emergency operations? How about the parents? Do we subject them to swabs as well? Do we need infectious disease specialist clearance for our patients? When do we test them? From the time of exposure? From the time of the onset of symptoms? There are a lot of possible results from this test. There can be true positives, false positives, true negatives, false negatives, asymptomatic carriers, etc. I would like them to, I would like to leave them to this, uh, my pediatrician friends, you know your opinion matters to me. We all know that as an, as an evolving disease process, it takes more than a test to diagnose a COVID-19 patient, or even a certain if one is an infection or not. Uh, so we usually need a team for a collaboration of experts to determine diagnosis. But for the consensus of us anesthesiologists, we're going to ask us, are we going to test or not? The answer is to test the patient, test the parent. For a variety of reasons, the test result may not be available at the time of operation, especially if the operation is an emergency one. But to test just the same, so we can use the result to retrace exposure later on. Whatever the result, the consensus is Whatever the result, the consensus is to down the highest level of protective gear in order to protect the staff and to prevent contaminating the other operating rooms. All potential COVID-19 patients should be operated on in a negative pressure operating rooms with adjacent donning and doffing areas in a negative pressure environment as well. It is advised that this COVID-19 OR area be located in a portion of the complex and isolated them from the rest of the cleaner rooms. There must be a dedicated elevator for the COVID-19 patient with the dedicated hall as well. The operating room COVID-19 complex should also be well ventilated, designed, and maybe re-engineered for more rapid air exchanges. It to say we should avoid as much as possible rooms with interconnected air conditioning systems in the absence of negative pressure environment the operating room should have a HEPA filters place instead. As we all know, COVID-19 is more influential than influenza. The virus aerosolizes more easily, remain airborne longer, so the use of full protection for practitioners is well recommended with the use of N95 masks, PAPRs, head covers, eye shields, to two to three layers of gowns, two to three layers of gloves with shoe and foot covers. It's also imperative that the practitioners don and doff their PPEs properly. 
Well, we agree that the protective use of all these measures are beneficial. Some concerns include difficulty of communication to the other members of the surgical team when we done these PPRs or we are hard, often hardly heard when we talk and we hardly hear them when they talk. Visibility, visibility is oftentimes also affected as shields they fog easily, movements are restricted as well. A range, we use a lot of uh, breathing filters, heat and moisture exchangers, HMEs or what we call the heat and moisture exchangers and combined heat and moisture exchanging filters, HMEF. These are products for patient production and humidification for use in anesthesia. They come in several sizes appropriate to weight and age, and we can use them for patients with, even with tidal volumes as low as uh, little as 20 ml. Now we use a lot of these filters uh, in this pandemic. Of course, this adds to the overall cost of healthcare expense. They are connected both to the inspiratory and expiratory end of the breathing circuit. There are drawbacks, however. These include one, the add resistance to breathing circuit, hence the breathing is increased. Uh, two, they promote carbon dioxide retention. The implication of these first two reasons is for a lot of symbiotic brain. We tend to use more of uh, neuromuscular blocking agents, muscle relaxants. We paralyze the patient, control the breathing, and in order to facilitate ventilation. And three, these filters are also relatively heavy, hence they make a soft tube even promote disconnect breathing circuit. The use of a vigil is the recommended standard for laryngoscope in this pandemic. And like the traditional laryngoscope, which offers a direct view of the larynx, but the building office indirect one. The implication is you stay away from the patient's airway while the uh, airway, while the lingoscope visualization of the ling is much better with the device compared to a more traditional direct laryngoscope. There may be difficult insertion of the endotracheal tube in the hands of an inexperienced practitioner. Open times you need to curb style it put that endotracheal tube in or use a proprietary style toilet design. We have been using a lot of aerosol boxes, incubating clear plastic ribs when we handle aerosol for surgery, as intubation carries high risk of transmission. These contraptions are potentially protective, not only to the intubator, but to the other practitioners as well, as they prevent the respiratory droplets from spreading. The aerosol box is cumbersome to use as it's made of transparent acrylic or glass. The intubating drape compared to the aerosol box has the added advantage of not leading the operator dexterity. Now, uh, during this time of pandemic, we have identified a lot of things on how we can conduct our anesthesia, cognizant of the fact that the conduct of general anesthesia is really an aerosol-generating medical procedure, and uh, these modifications include the following, how we remediate the patient, how we do a bag bus ventilation, the three the hierarchy of courses, like an intravenous induction over a gas induction, conduction regional anesthesia, single thing over anesthesia visible, and the choice of airway device, cuff and to tube over a cuff and the choice Supraglottic device like an enemy arm cupping and to prevent crying. It's a very initial generating substation prior to induction of anesthesia. It's recommended unless there's an obstruction. Initial that recommended. So uh, during induction of anesthesia, intravenous induction is over general, which means that the patient should return to have an IV congestion place before he's been sealed inside the operating room. So in the conduct of an intravenous induction, rapid sequence or modified rapid sequence of induction is done. The sequence of administration of sedative hypnotic, a selix maneuver administration, short acting neuromuscular blocking drug before we do a laryngoscopy and then treatment. Okay, is this time plan and in doubt the following are recommended. Again, Use of an endotracheal tube, cup one, 
visual endoscope and the, they suggest that the most experienced intubator should be the one that should intubate. We use the inline closed suction system, suction secretions. Bear in mind also that I should be intubated in ICU and not brought to the OR for intubation purposes. If for some reason one can intubate an LMA with a good seal may be acceptable. In mind, simple face mask be reduced, aerosol dispersible, and nasal cannula and bug mask ventilators are less desirable in these conditions. All every, de every devices pertain to what we call endotech tubes, a supraglottic device like LMA, eye gel, isoparyngeal element, and the recommendation of a lot of governing bodies, uh, CDC, ASA, a Royal College of Anesthetists, and many more advocate endotracheal intubation with an endotracheal tube. For a variety of reasons, however, a supraglottic device is acceptable as long as it has a good seal. Handled manometers must be used to treat cough inflation, and capnography has always played an important role as should be the detectable carbon dioxide there should be uh, to confirm that you have placed e. uh, This will emphasize the importance of these filters, as I mentioned, and the proper placement of the filters between the breathing circuit and the patient's tissue machine, the use of HMEFs, and the use of low glass flows. At the end of the surgery, during the emergency room, and during the extubation process, the coronary the following, the coughing, deep extubation to prevent coughing, continuous to protect the drapes, uh, because we go from the area where he was operated and not on a more traditional back care unit. The patient is an ICU patient. It's advised that they are exhibited at the ICU and not inside the operating room. And even during transport, intubated patients should have the valve filters in place connected to their endotracheal tube. Then, and uh, at the end of surgery, during emergence, from anesthesia, and during extubation, we, uh, we have recommended the use of suction, coughing, deep extubation. All of these recommendations are placed in infographics for every reference. And uh, this is just uh, one example of them covering from the Department of Anesthesia. It's very detailed with all the pertinent recommendations. It includes the designated area in the hospital where we do COVID-19 suspect and confirmed cases, things we do, it commence an anesthetic, uh, things we do in the process of intubation and maintenance of anesthesia so that they do not miss out anything, and uh, things we do during emergence and extubation are all is stand for easy reference. And uh, what we do after the procedure, including disinfection measures for the instruments that were used, to even uh, trivial matters that are deemed very, very important, such as for the anesthesiologist to shower and take a bath, and even reminding us to wear new pair of gloves after attending to a potentially infected case. And uh, what we do after including disinfection measures, the instruments that were used to even trivial uh, uh, with that, thank you very much for your attention, hoping that this pandemic ends soon so that we continue to do once more the things we enjoy the most. Before we proceed to the Q&A and panel discussion, a few words from our sponsor. To the officers, members of the Philippine Society of Pediatric Surgeons and its participants of this webinar, good day. Talmuseptin is humbly honored to be the sponsor of this webinar the Dr. June Resurrection Pediatric Surgery Webinar Series. This webinar greatly enhanced our healthcare professionals' ability to fight against the, this pandemic, COVID-19, which is tremendously affecting all of us worldwide, killing half a million people and affecting our frontliners, doctors and nurses. Our medical experts are doing their best to heal the world. We are deeply saddened by the passing away of Dr. Edgar Resurrection, our dear good friend, and we are extending our deepest sympathy to the family and to the Philippine Society of Pediatric Surgeons as well. 
Calmuceptin will always be around to support and help healthcare professionals, especially in the field of wound care management. We have wound care experts throughout the world to help us educate more about wounds. Calmoceptin is proud to sponsor Woundpedia wound care courses, both basic and advanced courses to doctors and nurses in the Philippines. Calmoceptin ointment, Calmoceptin Philippines. We are very thankful to be part of the Philippine Society of Pediatric Surgeons Activities through the years. Thank you so much. To facilitate our Q&A, welcome our moderator, Dr. Wilma Baltazar. Good morning, everyone. And I'd like to congratulate and thank our speakers for their very excellent uh, sharing of their expertise, especially in, in this era of COVID. Um, if you have any questions, we're very sorry about the audio of Dr. Valera, but do not despair. Dr. Valera is here with us now. So if you have any questions to ask him, or if there's anybody who wants to ask any of our panelists, please put your Q&A, your questions in the Q&A box. And if there's anybody, I've seen four, who wants to ask the, the questions themselves, you can just uh, uh, tap the hand button and we will entertain your, your questions. We actually have prepared one case, if we have the time. Okay. So let's start with the questions first. Much. Do you have any questions? Yes, ma'am. We have a question for Dr. Sagil from Dr. Grace Batad. How helpful would Alvarado score be? Oh, Alvarado score? And the Alvarado score was really devised for emergency room physicians. I have already taught residents and trainees regarding the use of Alvarado score. It is very helpful in the sense that after you get a seven, you know, Zero to four is not appendicitis. Grade four to seven is probable appendicitis, but need energy. More than seven is almost your appendicitis. So how helpful is it? If you have very low access, very poor access to diagnostic procedures like an uh, ultrasound or scan, and you're still not very sure, you may have to refer the patient to uh, another that has those tests. The other thing is, uh, if you're going to proceed with non-operative management, it's imperative that you have documented appendicitis first. So when you say documented, documented by the NHP. So, and helpful is it? Not very. Not there. It's only helpful if you were able to rule out appendicitis. So four and below. Chen, would you like to comment on the Alvarado score? Because um, yes, I, I will agree. It is um it's still useful. However, you have to know that yes, Paul. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Can you hear me? Yeah, there. Um I, I think it's still useful in in these cases. However, uh, you have to remember that um there might be several modifications, especially if um we're talking about children and low resource settings, because uh the problem would be for some Parents, they would rather they they would want to hold off on laboratories, so that would be quite difficult to assess because you would need uh, a CBC for that one. But um, in a low resource without availability, um, it's still possible. But I'd say proceed with caution. Okay, thank because you. Not, yes, be, sorry. Also, because not with all children, not all of them would actually have right lower quadrant. They would most of the time start. And with epigastric pain. Okay. Did that answer your question? Other questions, Mooch? Uh, yes, ma'am. Again, for Dr. Sagil, how long do you wait before you intervene and go for surgery? Would a two to three day medical trial be sufficient for observing clinical response? This is from Dr. Juliet Aguilar. I actually answered it through the text because it said type answer. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, a two to three day wait is. Now, this is supposing that you have a non-surgical, non-ruptured huh, and complicated appendicitis. A two to three day wait is okay. We usually ask for a repeat CBC you know, on the third day. You have to document that the leukocytosis is improving. And then the patient has to become a fever. If the patient persists in having fever and the patient uh, persists in having severe 
pain and guarding in the right lower quadrant, then at the end of two days, going two days, you can already say that the non-operative management is probably not working. Okay, uh, thank she you. asked also about consent. She also asked about consent. Currently, we don't have any special consent for managing uh, medically, so it's more of a discussion rather than a spe specific informed consent. But definitely, if it becomes an issue, an informed consent form is probably in your best interest as a doctor. Okay, thank you, Yes. Anything? Any other questions? Much? There's what? another question, ma'am. If is, is there merit? It. Uh, hello, ma'am. Yes, yes, yes. Is there's another question, po? Is there merit in giving preoperative dexamethasone in preparation for emergency surgery? Maybe Dr. Jimenez will want to to tackle that. Good morning, Dr. Bertasar. Good morning, Good morning, everyone. Thank you for your excellent lectures. Uh, first of all, um, the use of dexamethasone, dexamethasone in children that's still being studied. In our in PCMC, we haven't actually uh, instituted any of the trial drugs because we're not a COVID facility. But uh, I think from NIH in the latest publication, it says that dexamethasone should be used only for those who are severely or critically ill or mechanically ventilated or using very high flow oxygen. But um, that is not, okay, as in anything that still needs to have a lot of studies before we use that as a standard of treatment. So maybe my colleagues in PGH, uh, which is a COVID facility, might have had more experience with the use of steroids. But as of now, um, that is the recommendation. I Mary Ann, any, any inputs, Mary Ann? Uh, Ma'am, I agree with Tini with regards to its application for COVID patients. Uh, however, um, among our asthmatic patients also, it has not been routinely used, preoperatively. Because uh, especially if uh, surgery is elective, we recommend that the asthma be approved first. And if there has been a recent attack, that the surgery should be postponed or deferred for at least four to six weeks after the last asthma attack. But as a routine procedure, uh, it has not been done yet or not being done. Okay, I hope those, those are, uh, that answered your question. Anonymous kasi. And there's one more, no, Mooch? There's one more question. Well, there are additional questions, ma'am. So, were there patients with appendicitis managed medically who eventually needed surgery? Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes. Only 75% effective at this time. And usually, yes, when did you decide that uh, the, the medical management wasn't working? Usually, how many days? Or what were the symptoms? Well, two, maximum three days. Because you can really see the difference after the, at the end of first day, after 24 hours of antibiotics, there's a very distinct decrease in abdominal pain. The usual reason why we don't, it doesn't work, our non-operative management is when there's a fecal issue, and two, when there is uh, antimicrobial resistance, the uh, medications that we're giving. That's why we're not giving pomoxiclav, because we're very high resistance to pomoxiclav for our enterobacterial, uh, enterobacterial. Okay, thank you, S. There's, there are more questions, Mooch, or let's ask, Let's ask a, a somebody who raised his or her head. Um, can you unmute uh, Mary Joy? Mary Joy has a question. Pawi, can you unmute Mary Joy? Mary Joy, can you open your your audio? Um, hello, ma'am. Yeah, is this Mary Joy? Um, I know, ma'am. This is uh, Nika Balitar. But there is still um, one question po. Oh, okay. Yes, ma'am. Um, are there cases of false positive RT-PCR? This is from Mr. Chat or Peace po. Address to everyone po. Uh, let's start with Timmy. Hi, ma'am. Um, okay, from my colleague, Chat Corpus, I think that's coming from your experience. Um, yes, I, I, we, that was the first one, okay? That was the first and only one as from the time that we had our lockdown. 
Now, there have been uh, guidelines that have been put forth and that involved, uh, I think in your case, it was the, it was a neonate. So the possibility of having a positive mom despite a negative chest x-ray or signs and symptoms is real, basically because uh, of our localized transmission. So I expect everybody to be suspect at least. So the newborn society had their guidelines too that um, you repeat your swab after 24 hours just to see because the possibility of having contamination right is there so that was would be one of the reasons and i remember that this patient turned out negative subsequently after the first positive so you still have to rely really on your signs and symptoms and your other diagnostic tests so the possibility of really having false positives is there but your rt pcr is supposedly 100 percent specific but there's around like for the symptomatics like there's a false negative around 11 to 40 percent thank you um, i think there's a question for anesthesia which yes ma'am uh this is for dr valera what solution to do if no negative pressure room is available uh hello yes uh, can you hear me now yes we can hear you uh yeah the the solution is the recommendation of the center for disease control would be to place uh, filters in your bracing circuits as well as place filters in your uh, operating room complex so uh, if you don't have uh, negative pressure rooms are engineered rooms no so they do they put a series of pumps but if it's that possible use HEPA filters in your air conditioning units okay thank you Dali I think a lot of hospitals are really doing that but it's quite expensive yes negative pressure room also they are we are so we're Filipinos to improvise so yeah. any more questions I think I want to hear an oral question so can you unmute um Wait, huh? I think si kanina pa kasi naka-raise si ano eh. Si Mary Joy. Pawi, can you unmute Mary Joy? Let's have a, um, an oral question. Mary Joy, you have to unmute yourself also. I'm not responding right now, ma'am. Oh, how Maybe about uh, Dr. Sahar? Dr. Sahar, that's a question. And all the way from Amay Pap... Um, Amal Pakpak in the in, in Mindanao. Yeah, can you give your question, Dr. Sahar? Uh, I think ma'am hindi po ano. Huh? <laughs> Can't hear. Sorry, ma'am. I think we should proceed to the yeah, next. Yeah, yeah. Unmute. Then I will proceed to the next. Huh? See, how about uh, Melanie? I don't know. Dexter has a question. Dexter? No, actually, I would like to react on the negative pressure. Uh, ah, okay. That was asked from uh, Dr. Valera. You know, uh, negative pressure machine is so expensive, as well as your doctor. Uh, I don't think uh, provinces, I mean, the hospital provinces in the provinces would be able to afford it. So uh, the best solution from the uh, MacGyver thing is to make sure that 12 to 50 percent of the space, the airspace of the, house, the operating room, should be brought out within one hour. And I think UP did this uh, earlier on by establishing uh, an industrial exhaust fan that would be able to drive away uh, uh, the air, the space, the airspace into 12, 15 times within one hour. And that would solve the problem in a very uh, not so much expensive way. Thank you. Okay. 
uh, let's 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 have the question also for Dr. Valera because I think there will be a lot of questions because his his audio was not so clear and we're sorry for that. So we might as well entertain more anesthetic questions. I think there's one more. Yes, ma'am. For Dr. Valera, pediatric breathing circuit filters are not readily available. Do you recommend using adult filters? Is this advantageous or more harmful for pediatric patients, particularly neonates? Uh, one week ago, I did a, a, a neonate and we didn't have a neonatal filter at hand. And I tried using the adult uh, filters. Uh, but I won't recommend it because in a few minutes, once one of my end, the entitled CO2 readings became so high. So uh, I would have to revert to a non-filtered uh, breathing circuit. So I won't recommend it. The recommendation is uh, if you're going to use adult filters, the recommendation is the tidal volume should be at least 200 ml per minute and our neonates have uh, very much smaller tidal volumes than those. So if you don't have a neonatal filter, don't use an adult filter. I hope that answered your question. Uh, Any more time questions, so we might as well. Um, uh, the question on, on the antibiotics or what's the question, Mooch? Mooch, you're breaking up. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. How long do we give oral antibiotics for acute ap acute appendicitis managed non-surgically? It's three days IV and then patient is okay. You can discharge an oral antibiotics to complete 10 days. I saw the question about the incidence of periapendicial abscess. If you are doing a controlled medical management, meaning you discharge the patient with a normal WPP count with no test, there's no reason why you will have periapendicial abscess. It's a totally different thing if a patient is discharged from the emergency room with antibiotics for victim diagnosis of UTI and you get epilepsin or ciprofloxacin and the patient comes in, in moribund or with periapendicial abscess because the antibiotics were not correct and there was no proper monitoring. Yeah, and I think if you also send home somebody with appendicolit, then chances are your patient will come back with an abscess, okay? And uh, there are some more questions. Yes, ma'am. Um, uh, this, this is directed to Dr. Ison. A patient is scheduled for semi-urgent surgery with negative RT-PCR, but with pneumonia on chest X-ray. What would you suggest? Would you recommend to proceed to go ahead with surgery? The patient is asymptomatic. Um, so the, the question is, patient is with no symptoms, but the chest x-ray shows some signs of COVID and the uh, initial RT-PCR was negative. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Um, because uh, in the chest imaging guidelines released for pediatric COVID, the recommendation for asymptomatic and uh, children with uh, mild illness is actually to do chest x-ray. It's not routine and not recommended. But if there are findings and not compatible with the patient's clinical history and physical examination, and the RT-PCR is negative, I don't know if Timmy will agree with me on this, but the recommendation is to repeat the RT-PCR because the findings on chest x-ray are non-specific. And anything you see on chest x-ray or CT scan must still be confirmed uh, with a viral test. Can we hear from Timmy? Yes, um, yes, I agree with Mafa that yes, that's the thing that you can do. You can go ahead and repeat your test. But then again, if your surgery is urgent, I think you need you might need to consider going ahead with it and just protect yourselves by using level four PPE and reassess your patient afterwards. So those are two things that probably you can do. Okay, I, I think question, I... question no. if you re if when do you recommend to repeat? Do you repeat it right away or would you wait for a few days? Hi ma'am, good morning. Well, well, for me, you can, it, it really depends, right? For asymptomatics, that would be harder. 
But for symptomatics, that would be, I think, easier. You can repeat. There's no number of days that you need to observe. And I'm saying this from my uh, perspective or my, my own opinion. So if you need to do it, then, then go ahead and do it, right? And uh, you have to look at all the other diagnostic tests that you also have done. So the urgency of the procedure, the index of suspicion, signs and symptoms aside from diagnostics, probably would aid you to decide whether or not, okay, you're going to go ahead with the procedure and next if you're going to repeat. Now, if you repeat your RT-PCR, you know that there will be, um, if, if you do repeat it, you have to remember that your results can even turn out positive because your antigens okay may stay there not necessarily that they're infectious or that you can transmit it but it only means that you still have the antigen or you still have the virus so some of them have have persisted beyond 12 weeks okay so uh, there are papers that will tell you that if you ever do get a positive rt-pcr within 90 days right but they remain asymptomatic then probably it's not a reinfection. So generally, you clear for the immunocompetent ones, you generally clear the virus within 10 days. And for the immunocompromised, it's around 20 days. So I hope that answers the question. Okay, thank you. Do you thank still you. have more questions, Mooch, or can we go to the case? There's One more, ma'am. No more. For Dr. Jimenez, is there already a documented vertical transmission from a COVID-19 mother to her baby here in the Philippines? As far as I know, none. But probably my neonatologists uh, in other parts may shed light on this. But for our institution, at least, we have not documented Check. a positive. Check. About Cheng or, or Mary Ann? No. Uh, as far as I, I don't know any. No. Yes, Mom, Mom, I know at, at PCMC we have uh, we have had I know three inborn neonates who turned out COVID positive, but I don't have a uh, specific detail, so I'm not really sure if they were tested or swabbed right after birth. Or was the mom was the patient. mother also tested? And yes, for that particular patient, ma'am. Okay, we've had cases. You think it's more of community transmission, really. The moms were not swabbed. The very first one that turned out to be, I feel, that was false positive, right? Uh, the mother had a negative x-ray, but unfortunately, the swab was not done. So for the other patient, uh, this patient, after three days, okay, turned out to be RT-positive, RT-PCR positive. It was like an inborn patient. So... So really, there are so many things you might have been doing, uh, many considerations. You might have done the swab too early. They were like in the, they were asymptomatics or they were incubating or probably specimen collection. And of course, your hospital environment. You know, some of these patients actually, uh, most of our surgical patients that I got to survey did very well, that, but most of them succumbed to nosocomial infection. Only a few uh, actually end those with comorbid. So I hope that answers the question. Yeah, I think we should be asking more hospitals because I'm sure maybe there are smaller hospitals and they don't get to report it to us. There's one question from Dr. Papulan. Will complications in delay in surgery be the same in both populations of COVID-19 positive versus negative? Do surgeons take prophylaxis? I think after there's no prophylaxis for COVID for one, so the current recommendations are, wala na tayo PUI and PUM if you remember. So you only become suspect if you develop symptoms. Now regarding the um, possibility of complications, whether it's a COVID positive or COVID negative patient, currently none reported because the vast majority of patients who are COVID positive will actually be mild or asymptomatic. Okay. So it only depends now. Your only concern now will be a patient who is, has moderate pneumonia, which is something like our patients who we operate emergency surgery who so have neonatal pneumonia. So that would be the same uh, same risks. Um, regarding questions earlier about vertical transmission, it will be very difficult to really assess the risk because not all hospitals 
do routine testing of mothers who give birth. In PGH, the current positivity rate of mothers for not for normal spontaneous vaginal delivery is in the 10 to 15 percent range. Okay. So we go because we test. But if you don't test, like particularly in lying in, they don't really test. So you will never know. They are both asymptomatic. Okay, let's have one last question before we go to the case. I hope you you are willing to stay for the case. It's a short case, and we will just let you comment about it. But there's one more question: How to explain to parents to defer elective inguinal herniography? Yeah, asking if I can give the assurance that there is no danger of incarceration. I think you cannot be assured. Yes, I think that's a very really simple thing. One is, how many hospitals now allow elective surgeries, particularly for public hospitals? So it's all in the news. Number two, you give them the lowdown. Give them, the, give them everything, all the facts. If you can find an astrologist who will do your case, if you can find a hospital that you will do your case and a surgeon will do the case, fine. And then accept the risks. Um, in, in, Mom, in NCR, kasi, we're in a very high-risk situation. It, this what I'm saying now is not necessarily the same in in areas in the Philippines where there is very low transmission, almost no transmission. So a lot of it has to depend on the situation of the community as regards the COVID nineteen epidemic uh, pandemic. Okay. As finally, Doctor Sahar has a question, and it's it's now in English. <laughs> Sorry for not being online. And she says. Um, if we had an I we had an IM patient, so this is a, a dog, incidental finding of periappendicial abscess, presenting with abdominal pain, vomiting, diarrhea, but with no respiratory symptoms, hence no swab was done. But because of, of the surgical team's request, uh, required oh no, the surgical team required gene expert swab for a procedure, it was done and turned out positive. Do we do rapid and do we do rapid antibody tests to all admitted patients to tackle COVID patients, or is it is it wise, or can we order rapid antibody tests based on patients' clinical status? So I think this is a question for for Fatima and um, the our pediatric. Uh, if I, this may... is, I am patient, so she's just asking. Okay, if, if I may go ahead, um, your rapid antibody test should never be used for screening. Your RT-PCR remains to be your gold standard. It would be true that if you really want to see, right, probably you look into the week of illness that you're, you have done the swab or you're doing the swab. So your rapid antibody test, usually the value of that is that uh, of um, for epidemiologic purposes you want to see the state in your community or you want to see if this patient had no be you'll, you'll you'll be looking at your igm and your ng igg antibodies but then again the more perfect or the better rapid antibody tests in this instance would be your emo illuminescence or your eclea you've heard of that and your ELISA and not your lateral flow or the ones that are widely being used you know, because that lateral flow was very, very and varied sensitivity and specificity. So you can actually complement both, right? But you also have to look into the timing of doing so and the type of this test that you're going to use. So RT-PCR still remains to be the gold standard. So it could be complementary, but usually never use it as screening. Do you do you know what institutions of the Elica? Ah, yes, ma'am. Med medical City, um, medical mm -hmm. the Eclea or, or the Eclea has I know, and there are other. I'm not too sure about the other institutions, but that's one. Oh, we have the Eclea, and th that is patterned with your RT PCR, and it's not a standalone. Okay. Uh, let's have the case. Okay, so this is just very short. We will run through the case until the end, and we would just like to have a short comments from each one of you, okay? Uh, Fabi, can we have the case, please? And in the meantime, I'd like to say hello to Eileen. 
Can we ask everyone to mute themselves? Seen in a local hospital and was assessed with acute appendicitis. So I transferred them to a tertiary medical center. As medical and social history were unremarkable, no known exposure or contact to COVID 19 positive person. Does not live also in a COVID 19 hotspot. EE shows stable vital signs, no signs of respiratory distress, clear breath sounds, no rouse and wheeze, soft abdomen, but with direct and rebound right lower front and tenderness. Other tests show normal hemoglobin and hematocrit, increased WBC count with neutrophilia, a normal chest x ray, COVID 19 nasopharyngeal swabs were taken then, but results were pending. This patient underwent open appendectomy under general anesthesia. Findings were ruptured appendicitis with localized right lower quadrant peritonitis. No intraoperative or immediate postoperative complication. Post-op course were une uneventful. Discharged well, afibrile, and with normal bowel movement after five days of antibiotics. COVID-19 results came back positive for the SARS-CoV-2 virus after 15 days, 14 days post-surgery, 9 days post-discharge. Family then was asked to isolate for 13 days further. Thank you very much. We would like to ask each of you to comment whether you are going to do conservative or, or should you have waited for the test. Uh, a result before you do the surgery. So, can we start with Cheng? When my question was, when the, the patient came in because I did a ruptured appendicitis, what the symptoms when did it start? When did the symptoms start? I think uh, four days. Four days. Be, um, my, I think that was my only comment. Why did the, if it was abdominal? Pain, why did the patient's family wait four days prior to set us um, getting consult? Again, if it's abdominal pain and it, and they've seen a, a, a physician via teleconsult most of the time, if there's no improvement in 24 hours, then they should follow up. That, that However, if in this case it's already ruptured, would you have... Uh, would you have done uh, surgery without um, uh, a swab? If it's in an if it's an emergency case, I would still do. You know, all PPEs and everything because I think it's still. I mean, it's a matter of life and death. You would have you would have still done the surgery. My my only comment is they why did they wait four days before before having uh, a consult? I think Chang, that's the usual now because of the COVID uh, scare. I think parents are scared to bring their parents, so we usually get them actually late. Four days. So I ako lang po ayon. If if there you see the patient, check if you know make the patients hop up and down. If they cannot, then consider it might be surgical. There's a they it does not they cannot go they cannot jump. You do maneuvers to te telecon. If it doesn't improve in 24 hours, then go go follow up again. Go to the ER. I think that's what we got for your lecture, no? that, yes. that okay. You can do teleconference. You can. Teleconference, actually. Yes. <laughs> right? So that's very good to know. Uh, how about Mary Ann? Any. Wala uh, walang respiratory problem. <laughs> yeah. No, but uh, the, the presentation of the patient with fever and abdominal pain makes him a COVID suspect. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think. Uh, I share the sentiment of uh, our gastroenterologist, but that is really the scenario now that we are having in most hospitals because of their fear to go to the hospital for consult. Um, but I think the team um, more or less followed the existing guidelines. The patient was swabbed on admission, and I suppose they were in full PCD during the OR, and all precautions were followed because uh, it appears to me that this was really an emergency case. So my issue 
and the challenge, one of the challenges I identified early, early on was uh, the existence of guidelines and institutional protocols regarding cohorting of patients suspected, suspected of COVID but with swab result pending and if these sections prevention and control measures are still necessary during the course of the patient's admission to minimize the risk of the healthcare work. Okay. Timmy? Ma'am, I agree with the both of them. <laughs> I think that's the only one I'm going to, I think they've already covered all the aspects in addition to what Mafia was saying though. Infrastructure is really a problem. That's one for resource limited institutions, those who have been overwhelmed. It would be ideal to have old overs before you, uh, before you subject them to any yeah. procedure, but the, emer the urgency of it, if you need to go in, just protect yourself and then reassess after and make sure that you uh, have an ICC with you post-op so that you can decide where to go. Was the advice uh, when the patient's okay. result came a positive? Was it a good advice? I think when the patient yeah. is in home, the advice should be to, you should be quarantining yourself, right? right. I'll stay late. Ideally, Dr. Wilma, it would be nice to swab everybody. That's one. You know? And I will count my day one from the time that, this, that the patient showed symptoms. And I would count 14 days from there, right? But, and that is on the assumption that since it's a family, the exposure, right? Everybody but was I, exposed. Uh, I think the, the had high level of exposure. COVID uh, symptomatic. I think well, I yes. think yeah. uh, had so. well if if the fever was due either to the COVID or the fever plus abdominal pain was due to the appendicitis. Um, I guess the the only thing that I can say is they did turn out positive not because of the COVID nineteen virus. I think it's because of local transmission. So everybody is at risk. So the possibility of having that virus, whether you're symptomatic or symptomatic, is there now. The fourteen day rule is actually very helpful. Now, they're saying that we don't need to repeat the RT-PCR because we know that the antigen can uh, persist for more than 12 weeks. So they okay. just say if you're symptom-free, then you just have to like quarantine yourself within the 14 days. Sorry for that long answer, ma'am. <laughs> no, it's okay. And the way that the, uh, you're willing to say, right? A few more minutes. Uh, for Dr. Valera, what anesthesia will you put this patient on? Uh -huh. It's going to be a no-brainer. It's going to be a uh, general anesthesia, uh, rapid sequence induction, no? uh, minimize bug mass ventilation, use lower pressures, uh, paralyze the patient. Now, there would be a question maybe on the post of pain control uh, after the surgery because uh, a few months back, there was an article in Lancet saying that NSAIDs might be uh, a little contraindicated because they might mask the symptoms or maybe diagnose, mask the diagnosis of uh, COVID-19. But I've been following up that uh, information and so far the Food and Drug Administration of the United States hasn't come up with a statement that would not recommend the use of uh, NSAIDs. So as of now, I will still maintain that patient on maybe a combination of narcotic and NSA for host of purposes. Ma'am, uh, ang comment ko lang, I would like to add that aside from maybe swabbing that uh, patient, we might as well swab the the caregiver, the parents, and uh, yeah, the parents and the caregiver for maybe the result might not be available at the time of surgery, but the results definitely would aid us after the surgery because we'll know where to place that patient, we will know how to protect ourselves, protect our family. That's Actually, it. in the lecture, I think the lecture team, uh, or was it you? I think you said you swab the patient and the bantai or the parent watching. Yeah. Yes. And then when, uh, how old, what age will you decide to do regional as against general anesthesia for this uh, acute abdomen? Uh, it would really depend on the on the patient, but most pediatric patients uh, from the teens down would usually require a general anesthesia. So uh, like 
How old is that? How old is uh, At a teen, maybe a 12 or a 13 year old down would require sometimes, a teen. Yes. Sometimes it depends on the patient. Makausap mo na, mukha, mukha masunuri yeah, na ba? Yeah, yeah. Pero on mga so, Pilipinas... So, six year old? Uh, six year old, we can do, we can do that. We can do <laughs> that. that. Mahirap <laughs> siguro. Ay. Not only my anesthesiologist wants to do a spinal on a six-year-old. Okay lang. <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe. It's yeah. the practice. <laughs> siguro sedate, sedate, deep sedate. And then yeah, the feet and then puso. But, but it's going to be, in the, the S, it's going to be very traumatic for a six-year-old to, yeah, to wake up with a paralyzed yeah. leg. Yeah, it's going to be very traumatic. That's why I was so surprised. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Esther, last day, Esther, last day on the case. Well, it's a that patient was even lucky that he got swabbed. Uh, early on, there were actually until now, Mama, there are still hospitals in the National Capital Region, Metro Manila, where they really stratified the patients and whether it's a patient who has possible exposure to COVID versus none. So I have some hospitals now which if they determine that the patient is a non-COVID case, they will not do a swab. I, I have those great uh, hospitals now. But by and large, most of our uh, tertiary hospitals request for a sub reopen. But the problem now is the results. Yeah. We have labs that put out the results 11th day post op, where it's already more than academic. Whether yeah. you got the when, poster. when we just started opening PGH, before we started opening PGH, we could get the result like uh, earlier. Right? Now that we have so many patients coming to be tested, I think. If you last that takes hours long, there are some hours, there are some like a few a few days. But now siguro, ano na, so it will be more difficult. So I think to sum this up, uh, well, we know that uh, doing surgery on children is already difficult enough. But now in the era of COVID, it is more difficult. But I think history, like Cheng said, history and PE is still important. If you can do it by e-consult, why not? And of course, you also want the surgeon wants to know whether you know the, the patient. Actually, from history and P, we, we told our fellows don't just ask exposure. You ask about the place where the patient is residing. So mm -hmm. high, high, I out, mataas yung yung yes. COVID ano nila in the population that I think there should be. There's a higher suspicion that this patient might be a COVID positive patient. So I think history. And the ge geographic location is important. But I think we, if we have help from our GI, our pulmonologists, our infectious friends, and of course our pediatric anesthesiologists, we still have to do what we have to do. So I think we'll come up with, with uh, better options. And uh, like S said, what we know now, we didn't know. And probably what we need to know for the next few months, we will have to read on it again. So I think policies should not be stagnant policies. They should be evolving policies in, in treating patients, pediatric patients with or with or emergency surgery in in uh, in this COVID area. So I'd like to thank all of you. And I think you know I noticed in webinars it's a question and answer that's fun. So, <laughs> We're very sorry about some of the glitches. You know, when we practiced, it was very smooth and very nice, but you know, in a way, what is important is you're here to answer the questions. And I'd like to thank our technical team. Yes. Congratulations, this is the first attempt. And yes. will be better. Uh, I think headed by Fawi and then all our fellows, our fellows and uh, and residents, there's Mooch, there's Pia, there's Benjamin, uh, there's Nita, uh, uh, Patrick, hello, uh, Patrick and Pia. Okay, so thank you very much, everyone. Thank you for your time. I think we, have, we now, I think, no more. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Thank you, everyone. Our vice president is yes. going to close the session. Thank you very much, Ma'am, Dr. Abatasar, and good morning to everyone. Thank you also to our speakers, Dr. Asagil, Dr. Ison, Dr. Asales, Dr. Jimenez, and Dr. Valera, for a very informative and excellent lectures in the field of expertise. 
And of, our, and of course, to our mentor, Dr. Robert Casar. I also extend the society's appreciation to Calmosep team, who is our ever supportive partner in the activities of the Philippine Society of Pediatric Surgeons, and everyone who have been a part to making this event a success. It is but fitting to start a series of webinars on COVID-19 because the pandemic will be likely be with us and will continue to pose a threat to everyone in the near future. With a heavy heart, we had to lose one of our very own to this pandemic, a colleague who is passionate to teach and is an inspiration in our surgical specialty. That's why the Society embarked on such webinars in honor of Dr. June Resu, as he is fondly known. This is only the first of a series of webinars, as mentioned, and I'm taking this opportunity to invite you again for these upcoming webinars this coming August. We will be posting these webinars on social media. It's a morning well spent, and I would like to thank you all, and stay safe, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for joining us this morning. All those who registered at our website will be receiving an email to the link for your certificate of attendance and CPD credits. We'll have to fill up the survey form in order to get your CPD credits. Thank you.